As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are a key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Vlog number 23, Len Sweet here, the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, 2020. And the title for today's vlog is Home Sweet Hell. The readings for today are some incredible readings that um, each one could, we could spend the whole time on. Uh, Exodus 1, the, um, the verse 8, and then ending in chapter 2, verse 12, verse 10. This is one of the great escape stories of the Bible. This is the story of the, the birth of and the saving of, of Moses as a baby, Moses and the bulrushes. And one of the earliest sermons I remember uh, compared faith. The title of the sermon was bulrushes and burning bushes to, to try and convey the two ways in which faith could form in in us one is the bulrush way which is from birth and you're brought up in a christian home and you're brought up in you know in an environment where you learn uh who, who jesus is and the other is the the burning bush way where it comes kind of cataclysmically and and uh just really spontaneously and almost a spontaneous combustion moment but this is the story of the beginning of the Exodus, one of the great stories of the Bible, when um, the story of how God frees people from slavery, from bondage, from everything that chains them. I mean, the Bible is an escape from slavery story. All the enslavements that bind us. And here is the beginning of one in, in Exodus. And then we have the, the psalm, Psalm 124, verses 1 to 8, where the psalmist tells of what it means to escape the snare. So it's another escape story, but, but it includes this incredible verse, Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Our help, where? Is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. We, we seek help in a lot of different places, but our help is in the Lord and the name of the Lord. So it's another escape story. How do you escape those snares and, and, and entanglements that, that would trap us and, and bind us and enslave us? And then the Romans text, uh, Romans 12, 1 to 8. We're, we're instructed to um, present our bodies as a living sacrifice. The old sacrificial system is, is done. Our bodies now are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and this is what we offer to God, is, is our bodies. And, and we are not to think of ourselves more highly than we, we think. And then this incredible passage that um, there's one body, many members. And so we are all members together of the one body of, of Christ. And what it means to be that that body of Christ. Uh, but I want to spend some time with this passage from Matthew. It's a very familiar passage. And, and I, I imagine every one of you listening to this has preached from it before. And, and so I, I'm going to be a little repetitive with things that probably you've already focused on. Matthew 16, 13 to 20. Now, this is where Jesus founds his church. And notice how he founds it on a pun. He's playing. He's punning with Peter Petros on this Petra. And, uh, but notice where he founds his church in Caesarea Philippi. And it's clear that he is having this exchange with Peter at a very place in Caesarea Philippi where there was something called the gates of hell. That's why Home Sweet Hell is the title of this little vlog. 
And as, as Jesus is standing there at this, this side of this mountain where there's this opening called the gates of Sheol, the gates of hell, this is, this is the exchange that takes place. When Jesus came to the regions of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, some say that you are John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say I am? So this is really a very human moment because he's saying, what, what are people saying about me? You know? what, what are people talking about me? Who, 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 what, what's the scuttlebutt out there about, about me? Um, and so his disciples tell him the truth. Well, there's, you got mixed reviews, Jesus. You got all sorts of uh, comments. And, and then Jesus whips it around and goes, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ. The Christ. Jesus Christos. The son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Wow. Is he standing at the gates of hell? Founding his church at the gates of hell? He's also telling his disciples that you will triumph over these gates of hell, and you will raise, R-A-Z-E, those gates of hell. Do you get it? Um, we are to be hell raisers. Not the R-A-I-S-E-R-S, -E but the hell R-A-Z-E-R. We're to raise hell, to be hell busters. The church should never be beyond shouting distance of the gates of hell or seeing distance of the gates of hell. Because to follow Jesus means when you can no longer see the gates of hell, you wandered away from Jesus. We are people called to always stand at the gates of hell. And I don't care what you are. I don't care whether you're, you're who, what you do for a living. We are to get down and dirty at those gates of hell. So if you're a writer, writers with sooty fingers and workers with blistered hands and gardeners with gritty fingernails or, and healers with bloody forearms, we're, we're, we are called to get down and dirty in dealing with the hellish issues of whatever our, our day is. Now, th this is where I get so, I mean, every, every one of us have a different button that people can push and, and it does it to us. But for one, one, of the, one of the buttons that really, that you, you push this button in me and I, I just really, I just kind of either shut up or, or, or shut down or something. God is in control. We don't need to worry. God's on the throne. Well, yeah, God is in control and Jesus is on the throne, but God put you on the pavement. God put you on the streets. That, that's, he's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us so we can be on the pavement, on the streets, at the gates of hell. Um, fields of ministry and mission are meant to be at the gates of hell. Not at the safe places, at the gates of hell. So the idea, oh, we don't need to worry, God's on the throne and, and, and God's in control, is, is a cheap high. And a lot of people are having this cheap high and, and this, you know, this COVID-19 thing, oh God, we don't need to, no. No, yes, Jesus is on the throne, but Jesus put you at the gates of hell. Um, Stephen King, one of the great writers of our day. Um, HBO, a couple of years ago, put together one of his novels. It was, a, I think, a seven-part series. And um, it's called The Out Outsider. And in that series, which is, it, it, and I, I don't watch horror movies, so this is really not a horror movie. Um, it's the one Stephen King, maybe non-horror, horror movie. <laughs> it didn't seem much, there wasn't much horrific stuff for me in that movie. But 
He has this one phrase in there. Then they, they were talking about following the, the trails. And, and one of the characters says, and these, this is Stephen King's phrase, um, that, that what he's looking for are the breadcrumbs from hell. And when he rec sees those breadcrumbs from hell, he just keeps following them back, tracing their origins. And I, I love that phrase. This is what we're called to do with Jesus founding his church at the gates of hell. We're to look for, not to flee from those breadcrumbs from hell, but to recognize them. Those are breadcrumbs from hell. And not to run away, but to run toward the origins of those breadcrumbs. I, that's why I love the Salvation Army so much. Uh, William and Catherine Booth, that's what they did. Every Salvation Army is planted. You find they traced the breadcrumbs from hell and said, okay, here's the Salvation Army. They, they went and found some more breadcrumbs from hell in another city. Then they put the Salvation Army right there at the origins of those breadcrumbs. Oh. Um, all hell breaks loose when you build a ministry and a mission at those gates of hell. Um, it, it's hard for us to, to understand that this is, that you don't run away, you run towards. I mean, Christianity is, is counterintuitive. You, you find your life by losing your self-centeredness and seeing yourself in the light and life of the Christ who saves and heals. The, the world believes that you, that you save yourself First by putting yourself first, and then by searching yourself, understanding yourself, esteeming yourself, going into yourself. No, Jesus said, lose yourself. Um, and and this, is the, this is the function of the church. It's, it's not to circle the wagons. It's to look for those breadcrumbs from hell and trace them. And, and this is why, one of the reasons um, why I think we cannot ever escape the, the prayer of St. Francis. And everybody, I mean, one thing we know about the prayer of St. Francis, St. Francis didn't write it. Okay, I, I know some of you, um, it's like when I tell people that there's no such thing in nature as a dove. A dove is just a white pigeon. People get mad at me. And, and St. Francis, um, this is not his, his prayer. Um, beyond any argument, um, he had been dead almost like, I don't know, 700 years and it was first printed, so there's no way, okay, there's no, no way you can get back to say, oh, this is a prayer of St. Francis. No, but it's a great prayer, and we can't escape this prayer because the prayer reminds us. It's a prayer that details the breadcrumbs from hell. Um, I call it the breadcrumbs from hell prayer, and that and that's why I love this prayer so much. So let me just remind you, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Now watch for the breadcrumbs. Where there is what? Hatred. Let me so love. Where there is injury. Pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Hey, here's a whole prayer based on here are the breadcrumbs from hell, and let's pray about each one of those breadcrumbs. Where there is hatred, so love. Make me an instrument of thy peace. The, the word here really is shalom, wholeness, healing. Not instruments, make me an instrument of divisiveness. Make me an instrument of, of hatred. Make me an instrument of, of conflict. Make me an instrument of purification. Make me an instrument of, of cancellation. No, make me an instrument of, of shalom, of shalom, of oneness, of wholeness. And I love that some religious, uh, Jesus gave instructions. I think it's in Luke 10. I could be wrong here, but whenever you go into a house, the first thing you say to the house is shalom. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I think there are some tr religious orders and traditions where they still do it. Whenever they enter a house, they, the first word they speak in that house as a guest, shalom. Make me an instrument of, of shalom. And, and where there is hatred, so love, not 
so getting even, not so cheap shots, but so love in the midst of hatred. See, Jesus didn't define his disciples by what they were against, but by what they were for. And we're, we, we are, what are we for? We're for love, we're for forgiveness, we're for mercy, we're for acting justly, walking humbly, loving mercy. It's what we're for. So at the breadcrumbs from hell, hatred, now build love. Where there is injury, pardon, not violence. Where there is injury, not retribution. Where there is injury, not, I get my nose out of joint, but where there is injury, forgiveness. Um, where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. That's why the ministry to the lepers was so important. Where there is darkness, light. I mean, we go to the gates of hell. We go to the dark places. I mean, Wesley, I, I wrote a whole book on this one quote, although I didn't quote, the, quote it in the whole book. But the book is based on Wesley's instruction to his his lieutenants and his, his leaders, his disciples. He said, now, I want you to go to all the dark places, and I want you to, that's where you start. I don't want you to go to the easy places, the, the safe places. I want you to go to the, the dark places. And uh, his disciples said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And Wesley said, I want you to go see miners in their pits. I want you to go see the poor in their hovels. I want you to go see the prisoners in their, in their cells. And he said, but... but it's dangerous for us to do that. We don't want to do that. And Wesley said, no. If you are one of mine, if you, are, if you call yourself a Methodist, you will go see the miners in their pits. I'm quoting here. You will go see the prisoners in their cells. You will go see the poor in their hovels. And he added this, God's already there. God will be with you. Hey, no, we're not bringing Jesus anywhere. We're, Jesus is already with those prisoners in their cells. He's already there with those miners in their pits. He's already with the poor in their hovels. He's already doing something, and we're to join him in what he's already up to, where there is darkness, despair, where there is sadness, hope. Um, how many people are still living in, the, in a grave of grief and they, they've dug a hole so deep for themselves they can't get out? A couple of nights ago, Bill Maher closed his, uh, his monologue with, uh, a, in his mind, a ringing indictment of Christianity. And he was, he was going at it. And he talked about how, um, you know, what... But when Jesus came to earth, uh, he, he made it clear that um, Jesus did not spend his entire ministry defeating slavery. Slavery was the number one economic and political, uh, the whole system, economic and political system of the day, of Jesus' day, was built on, on slavery. Now, slavery is a very different thing than it is today. You could actually, to pay a debt, you could sell yourself into slavery. And the word for slave and servant in the Bible is often the same word. So he, he, uh, he went on this rant about, you know, Jesus, he, didn't go, he wasn't an abolitionist. He didn't spend his time. And he wasn't a social justice warrior. He wasn't on a campaign against, against slavery. Um, he, um, he, 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 he didn't take on the worst social evils of his time. And, and this is all true. But then he went and zinged it, and he said, so when he comes back a second time, he owes everyone an apology for his ignorance, for his silence, for his refusal to take a stand on these evils of the day. And then he went into this rant about how God also, owed, the Father also owes an apology, and God the Spirit also owes an apology, and how the Old Testament and the New Testament are just these rant, these, these 
political documents supporting all these evils. And I'm going, are you kidding me? What? Wait a minute. Um, d does he not understand? I mean, what he's doing is he's just cherry picking little things here and little things there. But um, has he forgotten that the whole story of the Old Testament is an anti-slavery story as God is leaving, leading people out of slavery, out of bondage, and the story of how do you, how do you get out of slavery and out of bondage, and the prophets are speaking to the evils of their day, which are huge and enormous, and, and Jesus. I mean, Luke 4, what, what is his mission statement? Uh, let me give you his mission statement from Isaiah. It's another breadcrumbs from hell mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. He sent me to, to proclaim recovery of sight for the blind, to set the captives free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the Jubilee, where all things begin again, all debts are forgiven, all slaves are emancipated. It's the beginning, a whole new creation. I mean, Jesus is healing of slaves, Galatians 3. From Christ there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, Gentile nor Jew. Um, you are all one in Christ Jesus, the whole book of Philemon. I mean, are you kidding? The, the pagans understood this because they called Christianity a religion for slaves and women because it was a religion that spoke to women and slaves. And, and Jesus, see, he came to save all of these problems, to save the world and to heal and mend the brokenness of all creation. And it includes all the evils. Not, and there are a lot of evils out there. So um, let's remember that you do not have abolition and emancipation of slavery without Christians. That you had some enlightenment philosophers that would talk about anti-slavery, but the people who acted on it, the activists who were the people on the streets where the rubber hit the road were these converts, a lot of them, of the Second Great Awakening, where they went out and became abolitionists. And see, Jesus said, greater things will you do than I, because I send you my spirit that will work through you and continue my message and my meaning of my light in and through you. And that's what's going on here. As we continue the meaning and message of Jesus, as John Wesley said, if you're going to be a Methodist, you cannot own slaves or support slavery. And if you're going to support slavery or own slaves, you will not be and never will be a Methodist because Methodists are anti-slavery by definition. You do not have emancipation and abolition without Christianity. One of the most incredible forces in the history of the world. The most incredible force for good, for beauty, and for truth. And this is the gospel of Jesus. This is home, sweet hell. Whenever I went out on a trip, each one of my kids has an animal kind of that I bought them gifts related to their, their kind of animal. And so are in my daughter, my only daughter, was the owl. But I had a special relationship with her as my only daughter that I also would bring her back hearts. And each one of those hearts would have a story. And so she's got quite a collection of owls and hearts. A lot of it now is in storage, but <laughs> it's my fault because I brought her a lot of hearts. And, but each one of those hearts, I, I would bring it back and I'd tell her the story where I got this from and why this heart was special, why it reminded me of her. And I, I would always end it with, so and I bring you this because you have my heart and you have my heart. And, uh, so one day I came back, it had been a long trip, and I emptied out my pocket of all these hearts, and, I, and she was totally disinterested in any of these presents I had. And I said, Soren, what's the matter? I got all these hearts for you. And she goes, well, I made a heart for you, Dad. I, I want to give you a heart. And I said, whoa, wow. And I said, so you, you made me a heart. She said, yeah, close your eyes. So I did. And um, 
she said, she, I hear some rustling of paper. And then finally she said, okay, now you can open them. And here's my heart that I made for you. And I opened my eyes and the first thing I saw was a heart that was breaking in two. It was cracked in the middle. It was a weak, anemic, kind of sickly heart. It was just like an egg cracking. It was, it was a bit cracking. You could see the jagged crack in the middle as this heart was breaking in two. And I, when I saw this, my heart just sank because I knew I'd been gone a long time, but it wasn't that long. <laughs> and and uh, I thought we had a better relationship than this. And, and so my, my, my heart just really started to look like that heart. And then I came back at it again because what she had done is right where the heart was cracking open and breaking like a rising new day sun was being birthed a new heart a blood red beautiful healthy new heart being born out of that crack in the old heart and when i saw that i said if if you can come up with a better description of Jesus' mission and ministry than that one, in image form, good luck. Because Jesus came, I mean, to heal the brokenness of this world, broken relationship with God, broken relationship with ourselves, broken relationship with each other, broken relationship with the creation. And this all this brokenness, but but the promise of the gospel is, and that's why you found the church, Jesus did, on the gates of hell, is that in the midst of that brokenness, God's promise is that he will, God will birth a, a new heart. I'll give you a new heart, a new wholeness, a new shalom. So at the gates of hell, at the gates of brokenness, whatever that, and there's umpteen brokennesses in this world, Jesus' mission and message is for us to continue what he started. And that is, at the points, jagged edges of those brokenness, to birth a whole new heart, a heart of love, out of a heart of stone, a heart of hope, a heart of healing, a heart of shalom, home, sweet hell. Semiotics is the art of angling, of turning things askew, upside down, inside out, cattywampus, sunny side up, over easy, scrambled, hard boiled. We hope you enjoyed today's journey, but always remember, it's more important you prepare the preacher than you prepare the sermon.